Um, I have a slide deck to share with you, and today is a lot of words. And so I just want to invite you to um, let the let the information wash over you um, and anything that is important, that is potent for you will just land and seep its way in. Um, and I will also, of course, share the slide deck so you can go back and really um, dig in deeper if that um, if that moves you. Um, so let's see, I will go ahead and start sharing. Okay. How does that look for everyone? Thumbs up, Susie? Okay, great. Thank you. So, you know, we hear, we sort of bat these words around a lot, confidence, humility, self-esteem. And um, I thought I would just address this topic a little bit and kind of break it down in a way that has made sense to me. Um, and so we'll start. Let's see. Okay, I include this so that when I hand out the slide deck, you guys are resourced or whoever it lands with are resourced. But this is more about me if you're new here and want to, um, or new to me and want to read more about me, it'll be in the slide deck. So one sort of guiding idea concept that I think is really important Others' inability to see your value is not a reflection of your worth, right? Self-esteem, we'll start with a definition of self-esteem. Self-esteem is the evaluative perception and overall assessment an individual holds about their own worth, capabilities, and value. It encompasses one's emotional, cognitive, and behavioral attitudes towards oneself, right? So how we think about ourselves, how we feel about ourselves, and how we behave towards ourselves. Characteristics and significance of self-esteem. Um, self-esteem is characterized by a positive self-regard, a genuine appreciation for our intrinsic worth and personal qualities. Resilience, the, abil the ability to cope with life's challenges and setbacks effectively. Self-image and identity, how we perceive ourselves as an individual and in relation to others, um, all part of self-esteem. Um, motivation and achievement, good self-esteem propels us to pursue our goals with determination and perseverance, right? Because we have a sense of worth, and purpose. And so therefore, um, we set goals and we strive to meet them. Uh, emotional well-being, a healthy self-esteem tends to mean lower levels of anxiety and depression. Confidence defined. Confidence refers to a positive belief in one's own abilities, skill, knowledge, and capacity to navigate challenges and achieve goals. It is the assurance that one can com competently handle various situations. So, so you can see already that confidence and self-esteem sound similar, but they're not quite the same. And we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Characteristics and significance of confidence, self-assurance. Confidence empowers us to take calculated risks, make decisions, and initiate action. There's a, a clue there. Positive self-expectancy, an expectation of success and a belief that efforts will yield favorable outcomes, which in turn drives proactive behaviors, right? There's a certain, when you're confident, there's a certain aspect of, um, of willingness to take action. Uh, performance enhancement. Confidence reduces anxiety and enables us to focus on the task at hand, which in turn results in improved outcomes. Like, have you ever done something and you're not confident in it? And so then we're preoccupied with whether or not we will be able to handle the task at hand. When you're confident, you actually can focus not on what the outcome is going to be, but actually walking yourself through the process. 
uh, influence on perception. Confidence contributes to how others perceive us, right? Confidence is attractive. We're attracted to people that have a certain level of confidence. Confidence inspires trust, leadership, and therefore gives us the ability to be a positive influence on others. Humility defined. Humility is a virtue characterized by an honest recognition of one's own limitations, a modest view, self view, modest self view. So like we're right sized, right? We're, we're, we can be confident and, and humble at the same time um, because we have a right sized view of ourselves. Um, and an open willingness to learn from others and acknowledge their perspectives right? Which is all what the fellowship is really about. Characteristics and significance of humility. Self-awareness, the ability to look at oneself with balanced authenticity. Open-mindedness, receptive to new ideas and feedback, valuing the insights and experience of others as avenues for growth. Embracing imperfection. Acknowledge one's fallibility, and embracing imperfection as an essential part of the human experience. None of us are perfect. We don't need to be perfect. We're perfect in our imperfection. Healthy relationships. Humility, people who are humble are less inclined to be defensive, engage in power struggles, or dismiss the viewpoints of others. And if you're humble, you are committed to learning and growth seeking knowledge, admitting mistakes, and integrating new perspectives. So I came to this idea that confidence plus humility equals self-esteem, right? And there's that balance of confidence and humility, which in through one lens can seem uh, like opposites, like two sides of the, of the same coin. Um, and in actuality, they dovetail perfectly as skill sets. Confidence uh, contributes to self-esteem. Confidence assumes the mantle of a foundational pillar on which self-esteem is constructed. It emanates from the recognition of our competencies and capacities, forming the basis of a positive self-image. With confidence as a guiding compass, we can navigate challenges and aspirations with skill, tenacity, and a sense of agency. At the same time, excessive confidence may pave the way for hubris and arrogance, impeding personal growth and recovery. So again, there's that, there's that line that we walk with confidence where we can be confident in ourselves and our abilities and our capacities, but we remain right-sized and authentic in our um, assessment of self-importance. Humility's contribution to self-esteem. Humility, often misconstrued as the surrendering of strength, emerges as a cornerstone of self-esteem. Humility entails an honest appraisal of our limitations, coupled with an appreciation, appreciation for the multifaceted perspectives of others. This ability is, and willingness fosters a disposition of receptivity to learning, acknowledging mistakes, and embracing vulnerability. Embodying humility nurtures authenticity and self-acceptance, both fundamental underpinnings of robust self-esteem. So the dance of these different traits Confidence acts as a supporter, boosting the belief in our ability to overcome the challenges of addiction. It motivates us to set goals, take care of ourselves, and find strength when facing setbacks. However, the path to recovery is full of unexpected obstacles. This is where humility comes into play. Humility acts as a link between making progress and experiencing setbacks. It inspires us to seek help accept mistakes without blaming ourselves, and see recovery as an ongoing, messy, and rewarding process. Within the recovery journey, the dance of confidence and humility plays a pivotal role. As confidence fuels the determination to overcome obstacles and humility, encourages 
sorry, let me read that again. It needs a comma. As confidence fuels the determination to overcome obstacles and humility encourages seeking support and embracing mistakes. Together, they nurture the growth of self-esteem. The symbiotic relationship not only cultivates resilience, but also weaves a tapestry of self-worth that is essential for navigating the intricate path of recovery, right? I know I couldn't resist this little dog. <laughs> cultivating self-esteem, confidence, and humility. So here are the things that we can do, steps that we can take, think practices that we can embody um, as we walk along our path and uh, cultivate these qualities. Reflective contemplation or meditation. Regularly reflect on your strengths and areas for improvement. Acknowledge accomplishments with humility and use them to build confidence. Accept mistakes as opportunities for growth, right? So when we sit on a meditation cushion or we reflect or we have whatever your contemplative practice is, some people surf, some people crochet. Um, as you contemplate and reflect or meditate, right? Um, step out of your experience and the emotional attachment to it, right? So from a place of emotional sobriety, we can um, we can acknowledge our character defects, our accomplishments, our strengths, our growth, our skills, and we can also um, we can also sort of engage with that from an objective position where, where we can acknowledge without shame for the things that we've done wrong or the ways in which we've stumbled or showed up in a way that was unskillful um, and, and not beat ourselves up for that. We can recognize that as areas of growth and we can also celebrate some of the things and recognize and feel good about where we are now as opposed to where we were a year ago, for instance. Calibrated aspirations. Set objectives that challenge without overwhelming. I, I don't know about any of you guys, but I really need to remind myself of this often. From the time I was little, I have a report card in art class from my art teacher that he said, Mr. Vernola, Dominic Vernola, um, He's in first grade, he said, Zoe has finally learned to plan a project that she will be able to complete. <laughs> so um, this is something that I, I constantly do. I have giant aspirations and plans and dreams and visions for what I want to do. And, um, and I often am overwhelmed. I live very often in a state of overwhelm, which is one of the things that led me to drink, to relieve this, the sense of overwhelm and, um, and, and sort of give myself permission to sort of be in that state of um, softness. So that's, that's one of my um, sobriety goals is to be able to plan and challenge myself without getting overwhelmed. Um, little personal note. Gradually achieving these goals nurtures confidence and self-esteem, establishing a cycle of accomplishment, right? You ever feel that like where you're getting momentum, where you're taking care of small tasks and over a while you're able to look back and say, wow, I've actually moved from point A to point B. And here I am standing at point A, able to look back. I mean, standing at point B, able to look back at point A and say, okay, I, um, I have a sense of accomplishment now. Lifelong learning. Embrace the pursuit of knowledge and insight. Engage in discourse, read widely, and remain open to evolving perspectives to cultivate humility. You're all here in this room. So um, I, I have a feeling that you guys all sort of have a commitment to lifelong learning. Gratitude rituals. I know it's a little bit of a cliche, but there is there is one sure way that I have found for myself to get out of that feeling of feeling sorry for myself or feeling victimized or feeling like life is not fair. Um, or when I, when I start to compare what other people have or what I don't have or what I wish I had, 
Um, and that is with gratitude. Um, gratitude is a form of humility, right? So institute practices of gratitude to nourish humility. Recognize the contributions of external factors, whether that's your higher power or however you frame that for yourself. External factors can be the help, the help and support of the fellowship, of your sponsor, um, really anything. It can be a family member, it can be your dog or mother nature, but recognize the contributions of external factors and individuals to your journey. Seeking counsel. Without apprehension, seek guidance and aid when required. This demonstrates self-awareness, humility, and the pursuit of one's best interests. Compassionate self-reflection. Develop a voice, an internal voice of self-compassion. Approach your own fallibility with kindness and understanding, fostering humility. And finally, celebrate milestones. You're worth celebrating, right? So periodically acknowledge and celebrate progress, irrespective of magnitude. This collective acknowledgement bolsters self-esteem and reinforces the collaborative nature of the self. I love that, that collaborative nature of the self, right? You got many, many selves in there and they're all vying for attention and for, um, for uh, to have a voice and to be heard. And so um, skillful selfhood and, and therefore recovery um, with self-esteem and humility and, and confidence, I, I often see as sort of a negotiation of all the selves. I can imagine all myself sitting around a table um, interacting with each other and, and making the, the decisions so I'm going to read a Zen story called Empty Your Cup. And after, after the, I stop the slideshow in a, in a moment, I'm going to ask um, maybe for some reflections and interpretations and un understanding of the, of the story and how it applies here. So once upon a time, there was a wise Zen monk. People traveled from far away to seek his help. In return, he would teach them and show them the way to enlightenment. On this particular day, a scholar came to visit the master for advice. I have come to ask you to teach me about Zen, the scholar said. He was super excited, the scholar. He had all kinds of ideas. He had been reading and he decided that this would be um, his next area of inquiry. Soon it became obvious that the scholar was full of his own opinions and knowledge. He interrupted the master repeatedly with his own stories and failed to listen to what the master had to say. The master calmly suggested that they should have tea. So the master poured his guest a cup. The cup was filled and yet the master kept pouring until the cup overflowed onto the table, onto the floor, and finally onto the scholar's robes. The scholar cried, stop, the cup is full already, can't you see? Exactly, the Zen master replied with a smile. You are like this cup, so full of ideas that nothing more will fit in. Come back to me with an empty cup. Think about that for a moment. And I wanna end with this wonderful quote from Pema Chodron. If you don't know Pema Chodron, you can Google her. She is a Buddhist monk. I might have, it sounds familiar, I might have quoted her in a previous presentation. All these trips that we lay on ourselves, the heavy duty fearing that we're bad and the hoping that we're good, the identities that we so dearly cling to, the rage, the jealousy, and the addictions of all kinds, never touch our basic wealth. They are like clouds that temporarily block the sun. And our, our basic wealth that Pema is, is pointing to is, is our self-worth, our value. Do want to 
surface here, um, just a note, and I know all of you know this, but it's worth reminding uh, ourselves that even if we don't have something to share in, in the way of like, you know, our learning and our progress and our, and our shift and, and change and evolution, it's so important early on just to be seen, just to tell your story, even if you're at the lowest of the low, to not be silent and to, to allow yourself to show up in that way. That's the essence of Zen and Zen training is to really sort of have an experience of the concepts to, for, for the embodiment of it. And, and you're right. And, and that, you know, the scholar, I could have embellished the story much more, um, but there's something nice to just sort of get to the point. Zen is, is simple after all, but the scholar is like, yes, he's well-researched. He's you know, he's read all this stuff, he has ideas, he's super intelligent and capable. And so he was excited to come to the Zen master and show him everything that he knows, you know, to like impress the Zen master and to, to be special and to be the student who really gets it, you know, when actually it's, it's, um, it's not, it's Suzuki Roshi, who is one of the, one of the um, Suzuki Roshi and Maizumi Roshi. They're two of the um, Zen masters, priests who came uh, to America, brought Zen to America and sort of Americanized. Suzuki Roshi started the San Francisco Zen Center, which is one of the major Zen centers in the country. And he says that, uh, in the mind of the expert, oh, I'm gonna need to, I'm gonna need to look it up. It's so simple, and I say it all the time. Um, the mind of the beginner, there are many possibilities. Yes, and in the mind of the expert, there are none. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> um, the ubiquitous sort of quote. Um, but that's true, right? It's like that the idea that that we're going to come and impress and I've been that person. I've been that Zen scholar. I've been like, I'm going to show up and I'm going to have all the answers. I come to this meeting and I'm like, of course, I'm the speaker. So I need to actually um, share my perspectives and ideas that I've had. But like, you know, here I am with all of you. Each of you has just as much wisdom as I do. You know, I, curiosity, I, what I do is I, when I get righteous or angry um, or judgmental or defensive, um, or any of those sort of outward expressions of frustration and um, I get curious, I get curious. I get curious about my own reaction. I get curious about what is real for the person who I feel uh, critical of, you know? What, where are they coming from? What pain in them is causing them to take things personally and hear comments as crosstalk, as being about them? And what, what wounding and trauma are they carrying around that makes them feel susceptible to that? And how can I um, be, more, be more present to that, to, to what that is, and to hear what they're really needing underneath what they are saying, right? Um, Ramdas had this wonderful uh, sort of mantra of sorts. Um, when you are angry, when you're angry or judgmental or critical, just repeat to yourself over and over again, I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. And from that place, you can you know, he he was, you can imagine that Ram Dass was politically liberal. And um, back when George Bush, D George W. Bush was elected, and, and I'm not talking about politics, I have no, mm -hmm. no opinions about politics here. Um, but he, um, George W. Bush, in his eyes was problematic. It wasn't the, his candidate, it wasn't the person he wanted to be running the, com the, the company, the country. <laughs> And um, and so, and then we went into the to Iraq, 
right? And so it was a time of a lot of turmoil in the country. He put George W. Bush on his altar, a picture of him, and then later put Donald Trump on his uh, on his altar. And what that was for him, people were like, what are you doing? Like, you've got, you've got George Bush next to your picture of Maharaji or Guru and Buddha and all of the great saints. And then you've got George, what are you doing? And he, and he said, you know, I am loving awareness. I am praying for George W. Bush. He's a human being. And I'm, and I'm praying that he keeps us safe and makes good decisions and stays connected to what's important. And um, so there's a little bit of, of, of that maybe, I don't know if you can get what I, where I'm coming from, but, um, but that sort of, I am loving awareness, like, and laughing at myself for being so frustrated and angry, you know? just think about this. Um, one of the greatest gifts in cultivating the, uh, one of the greatest gifts is being able to cultivate holding multiple perspectives at once, right? And that contributes to the not knowing and that contributes to the humility, um, which ultimately contributes to self-esteem. So this is an exercise that I really recommend. Um, take a, a, an experience in your life um, this works really best if you work with something that was really challenging or difficult or hard or traumatic and start with something that isn't like 10 on the Richter scale of trauma. Start with something that's like a three or a four. And, and I'll, I'll share with you that um, the first time I did this, I, 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 I'm like about to go on a big tangent. So I'm self-managing and I'm going to I'm going to come to essence on this, as my Zen teacher says. Um, when I was 20 and at university, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and, and then I was 20 years old. I stayed at university. I grew up in New York. University of Pennsylvania was where I was in school. And, and that's in Philadelphia, which is two hours from home where my parents were. I decided to stay in uh, at university and I made arrangements and I stayed in the dorm and I took one class and, and while I was in treatment and it was it was overall and the treatment was successful knocking on wood and and I'm fine and now I'm 59 so that was nearly 40 years ago <laughs> so it has a happy story um, I am somebody who powers through you know like I was I, after the initial uh, terrifying few weeks of diagnosis till they got to the treatment plan and told me I was going to live, um, I, I was just, I just powered through. There's a lot of trauma that lives in the body. And we know that now, thanks to the body keeps the score, which someone mentioned and, um, and, and Gabor Mate, and the, we know so much more about trauma now than we did in 1984 when I was diagnosed. Um, so the first time I did this exercise, I used my experience of having had cancer at college at the age of 20. And the exercise is that you take many perspectives and you write them down. Um, so and this is, I should, maybe I'll do a talk on this, but um, so different perspectives, like um, the universe has my back. Everything happens for a reason. Life isn't fair. Um, a variety of different perspectives, right? From empowering to uh, victimizing to like the whole gamut. And then you write a page journal, like set a set a timer or not. You know, I did this in workshop the first time um, as a participant. And so we had like a 10 minute, you know, journal for 10 minutes. Tell the story of, of your event. Like tell the story of being diagnosed at 20 with cancer from the point of view of everything happens for a reason. And then go back and do the same thing from the perspective of life isn't fair. And it's amazing 
how many different um, ways you can hold an experience. And there's, listen, there are bits and pieces of truth in all of them. I am not someone who generally walks around feeling like life isn't fair, but boy, did I learn some things about some deeply rooted um, uh, suffering uh, around um, the experience of having cancer when I really allowed myself to explore in that mindset, which I categorically reject. Um, and so it was really a very healing um, experience to go through this exercise. And I use it. Um, I rarely journal. I'm not a journaler. I'm a, I'm an author and a writer, but I hate journaling and, um, I can't stop myself from editing as it's coming out of me. So, but I do in my meditation, sometimes explore different, are you laughing at me, Donald? Um, I, <laughs> I, um, I, I will often meditate on a, a situation, an argument with a friend or a, you know, I didn't get a job or, you know, whatever it is. And I'll, and I'll try on different perspectives to learn about all the various parts of myself in, in what needs sort of care or needing to be seen in that experience. So I hope that's helpful. Um, Many years ago, um, a very dear friend of mine and sort of fellow seeker on the path, um, she was in a really uh, challenging relationship and she would wake up every morning and do her morning practice. And in that morning practice, she would set her partner free on his path. And I loved that. And it really, similarly, when I was with my when I first was dating my husband and he was really wanting a par lifelong partner. And he just, he was, he was in pursuit of that. I was blissfully single for 12 years and had no intention of having a partner. And I, um, and, and I kept saying like, it's too bad. This guy isn't my guy because he, I love him. He's great. I have such a great time with him, but I'm going to break his heart eventually. Um, and, you know, there was this, and I was torn, I was conflicted. And I was on a business trip up in Northern California. And he was down in LA where we live. And uh, when we were dating, we didn't live together. And, and I was, I was on the phone with him walking, trying to find coffee on a Sunday morning. And I, and I said to him, I was like, once again, I was like, I don't know. And I really like you, but I'm really conflicted. And I don't know if I really want to have be emotionally responsible for someone in my life. And I love being single. And it wasn't about sex and sleeping with anybody else. It really was just making room to consider and hold somebody in my life. Right. And so I, and I was grappling with, with all the things that you're talking about, like boundaries. And, uh, and, and he said to me on the phone, he said, no one's keeping you here. You're free to go at any time. And I was like, are you, what? Hang on, uh, who's going anywhere? This is awesome. <laughs> like, it's like, whether we're, whether it's tomorrow or, you know, five years from now, you're, this is at will employment. You can leave at any time. Um, and I just thought, wow, that his ability was inspiring to me. His ability to acknowledge that like, we wake up every day and choose our, our, our people, our partners, you know, and, um, and nothing is guaranteed. And, and it, you know, so it, your needs are not expectations. That's a, that's a collapse of two different concepts. Um, so I just, Mayor, what I want to say to you is that, um, it's, I would like, I would invite you to think about your needs as defining your boundaries, right? So when you have a need, like I have a need for someone to, and, and I'll share with you because I don't know what your needs are, but I have a need for someone to be respectful of me. Like, I don't care if we're arguing. I don't care if you're spitting mad at me. That's fine. I can stand in the face of your anger. And I can hear what you what you're what you're expressing, but you can't disrespect me. 
that is a boundary that I have. And once it's crossed, I, I'm I, like, there's a whole cascade of, of stuff that happens in reaction to that. Um, so it's different from saying like, I have a boundary and that, that we speak respectfully to each other. Um, it's different from, I have an expectation. And if that expectation isn't met, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a problem, right? It, you can express your needs and boundaries that way. I, I expect to be respected. But what you can't do is have covert contracts where you have unexpressed, un, un, uh, unexpressed expectations, because that is a recipe that's, uh, what is it? Uh, expectations, uncommunicated expectations are uh, pre-planned resentments. So it's a little bit different. I think there's a lot of landscape that you're that you're missing there in terms of like, here's who I am, here's what I want in a relationship, here are my deal breakers, and here are my boundaries. And I'm gonna communicate these to you like neutrally. Like it's nothing personal, but here's here are my requirements. You know, you need to be this tall to ride the the ride. And so this is what I'm this is what I'm giving you as information about me and you can either play with me or not play with me right and that's kind of how you be in relationship and have needs and manage them and communicate them it's tricky stuff for sure especially with a history of codependency you know where you don't know where you stop and someone else begins but um but there's some good work to do there and and listen i've gone through many periods in my life where I retreat from from relationship and I pare down and I I think of it as like going into the zendo or going into the monastery or or going into the ashram you know and and just sort of being in in my own beingness and being of service but but there's something really beautiful to finding the capacity to let somebody in on a more intimate level and to let them love you um and see you in a way. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind as you process all this stuff. Thank you. Uh, how to best say this. Um, if you were to care for yourself first and foremost as a foundation, you will um, be able to to you you will be more likely to be open to healthy relationship um so you know our own we can only meet each other to the extent that we can meet ourselves so very often and i don't know you at all and i don't uh i don't mean to tell you anything about yourself and how you are but i do know that when we um when we focus on others, it's often a way of avoiding the, the focusing on ourselves and the care of ourselves and a sort of foundational self-worth and self-esteem and, um, and confidence, right? So you're, you're bringing this right back to the topic at hand, Ruth, um, cultivating those, um, those sort of skills or virtues or attributes um, will help you in meeting the world in a way that um, invites people in, in and out of your, of your life. Um, because one thing that I know for sure is that you're worth um, loving and knowing and um, being close to. I'd be so appreciative today. And I just want to thank everybody once again for the opportunity to be of service and um, and for being such a wonderful, engaged, thoughtful, vulnerable, open group of people. I love being here. So thank you. Thank you.